Hi, I'm Jules van Binsberg and a finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm Jonathan Burke, a finance professor at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And this is the All Else Equal podcast. Welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about shareholder versus stakeholder capitalism. This is a topic that has received a lot of attention recently. So let's first explain exactly what it is that we're talking about. Let's start with what exactly is shareholder capitalism? So shareholder capitalism is the idea that the purpose of a firm is to maximize the value of the firm to the shareholders, meaning that the profits that the firm generates are accruing to the shareholders, and that's what you're trying to maximize. Now, one statement that you recently hear a lot about shareholder capitalism is shareholder capitalism makes firms focus on short-term profits and thus will steer firms away from long-term value creation. What do you think about that, Jonathan? You know, I always laugh at that because the same people who claim that shareholder capitalism is short-term lord the venture capital industry in Silicon Valley. What could be more long-term than a shareholder, an equity investment in a startup? Most of these startups are not expecting dividends for 20, 30 years, if at all. I think what people are confusing in this case, Jonathan, is the question of, does the stock price reflect the present value of all the future profits of the firm versus what is the holding period that a particular investor holds a stock for? So even if you decide to only hold a stock for, say, six months, that doesn't mean that at each point in time, the price of the stock reflects all of the profits going forward. So as long as you try to maximize that stock price, you are actually doing long-term value maximization perfectly consistent with the long-term value creation. Yes, because even if you're holding the stock for the short term, at the end of that term, you have to sell it to somebody and that person has to value it. So like go back to venture capital. When the venture capitalists invest in, say, a successful startup, their objective is to get out long before the firm makes profits. So they are short-term investors, yet they very much care about the long term because they know when they get out, they have to sell to other investors who care about the long term. Yes. So one thing that we have established is that if we're going to have a discussion about a different model than shareholder capitalism, the argument that we need a different model because shareholder capitalism doesn't focus enough on the long term doesn't seem like a particularly convincing argument. But that doesn't prevent people from saying that it's time for a new model. And so recently we've been hearing a lot about stakeholder capitalism. Who are these stakeholders of the firm that people are talking about? So generally, we think about the employees of the firm or the customers of the firm, the suppliers of the firm, neighbors that live around the firm, perhaps even all of society. And what you often hear in this context is that they all must be represented equally. And to tell you the truth, Jonathan, I never quite understand what exactly that means. Yes, that neither do I, Jules. I don't know. You know, you could think about various different stakeholders further and further away from the firm. What about future generations that are affected by the firm? Are they also represented equally? I think a pretty vague term. But with that said, I think an important question to ask is when does shareholder capitalism and stakeholder capitalism not come to the same decisions? No, for sure. And so I think we need to be open to the possibility that firm activities have externalities, meaning the things that the firm does affects other people, sometimes in ways that isn't quite priced by the market. And because there's no price on it, the decision makers inside the firm may be ignoring these externalities when they're making their choices. If it's good for shareholders and good for stakeholders, then obviously the shareholder model and the stakeholder model give the same answer. So it's not an interesting question. Similarly, if it's bad for shareholders and bad for stakeholders, they also give the same answer. So the only interesting case is when they disagree with each other. What if I have a firm that is polluting? Then it's good for shareholders, but bad for stakeholders. And the question is, how should the decision be made on the, what the firm should do? Yeah, so let's do a simple example. Suppose that there is a firm 
that wants to do fishing in a lake. And because there's a lot of fish in the lake, there are lots of birds that hang around this lake. Let's think about the people that live on the lake as owning a firm together. They're the shareholders of the lake and they start fishing. And obviously they're maximizing their profits, which reduces the number of birds in the area. Now, clearly this has a negative externality, therefore, for the people that don't own the lake and don't immediately live on the lake. And the question is, what should be done in this particular case? Because there's a firm activity, there are shareholders, they're maximizing their profits by fishing, and there's a negative externality from the activity, which is the birds that are no longer there after we fish too much. So now how are we gonna solve this issue? I think the answer is the government taxes people who are fishing on the lake to make up for the externality of the lost birds. I agree. In principle, the government could solve this. A couple of, of notes, though. First of all, how do we set that tax rate? That is already a very complicated question, right? Because suppose that we would survey the people that live in that neighborhood and ask them, how important are these birds to you? Now, clearly, if they know that the government will set the tax rate based on the answer that they give, they have a huge moral hazard problem in the sense that they're going to over-report what exactly the value of these birds is to them. And so how is the government exactly going to decide how to set that tax rate? But more importantly, just abstracting from that issue, I think that a lot of people that adhere or are arguing for the stakeholder model, they sort of have come to the conclusion that the government isn't effective in addressing these issues. In other words, the democratic process is either too slow or too ineffective to solve these large problems of externalities like pollution. So let's take the government solving this problem off the table for a second. What would we do in that case? Well, I know what you want me to say. You want me to say that we should put stakeholders on the board of the company that decides who's fishing the lake and they can represent their interests and reduce the amount of fishing to bring back the birds. Sure, that would be one option. Although, of course, it's not so easy there either, right? Because how many board seats exactly are we going to give to these people? It's said that all the stakeholders need to be equally represented. But what does that mean? I, I mean, I'm not sure. But OK, if we assume that there is no government and we put the stakeholders on the board of the lake, then yes, there'll be less fishing and more birds. But what I, where I have a problem with is why then stop with birds? Once you put those stakeholders on the board, why don't they say, okay, actually, we also want a beach on the lake. In other words, how do we know the stakeholders will only represent the externalities? They won't also represent their own selfish interests. We need to know exactly how important everybody's interests are and how we're going to trade them off against each other. And I think that's the biggest weakness of the stakeholder model. First of all, it isn't very well defined who exactly can be counted as a stakeholder. Even if we had a very well defined group of people, how are we going to trade the interests of all these people off against each other? It seems like a particularly daunting task to me. I would say the biggest issue is the stakeholders who have no interest in the profits of the firm don't take into account how the actions reduce the profits. Assume we have a firm and the employees are represented on the board and the employees give themselves a pay increase so that there are no more dividends to pay to equity holders, just enough so the firm survives but doesn't grow. And so then potential future customers of the firm are hurt and all the potential future employees that they would have been hired had the firm grown are hurt. Obviously, current equity holders are hurt because presumably they expected a dividend, otherwise they wouldn't have invested anyway, all to the benefit of current employees. The problem with putting other people on the board is they are making decisions where they don't bear the costs. And that's a terrible idea. Yeah, so the incentives are not aligned. Absolutely. And of course, I understand that shareholders will make decisions to maximize their own benefit at the cost of societal benefits. But to me, the answer is not to try to solve it within the firm. The way to solve that is to have a responsible government that taxes the externalities. I think most people would agree with that too. What we're struggling with right now is what is the most effective system pragmatically to make all of this happen. And so given the fact that governments for such a long time haven't been as successful as some people would like 
they are now looking for other models. And the stakeholder model is just one of those options. But I don't have higher hopes for the stakeholder model of solving these problems relative to the governments that are trying to solve them. Okay, I think that was a very good time to introduce our guest, Jules. Our guest is Alex Edmonds, who is a finance professor at the London Business School. He has written a recent book on the topic of shareholder versus stakeholder capitalism called Grow the Pie. He's an expert in the area that we've just been discussing, and we're very happy to have him on the podcast. Welcome, Alex. Thanks so much, Jules and Jonathan, for having me on. It's, it's great to be here. We're so excited to have you on. So maybe I think to kick the discussion off, it would be helpful if you could maybe elaborate a bit on what, in your opinion, is the key difference between what many people know as shareholder capitalism or the shareholder model and stakeholder capitalism. I actually think there's far fewer differences than you might think. And you might think, well, doesn't that sound crazy? Isn't a shareholder or a company somebody only focused on short-term profit and wanting to exploit everybody else? But that's not the case because you open up Jonathan's textbook, shareholder value is a long-term concept. It's the present value of all future cash flows from now until the end of time. And that's not just in theory, it's there in practice. If you look at the valuations of Teslas of the world, that is based on more than just short-term earnings. So actually, if a company is focused on shareholder value, it will take stakeholders seriously. You have to treat your employees well, otherwise they'll leave. You can't pollute the environment, otherwise customers will stop buying, and you have to provide great customer service. But I still think there are differences, and there are a couple, and I think the most important one is externalities. So there are certain impacts that a company will have on society, which even in the long term will not feed through to shareholder value. So one might be carbon emissions. If there is not a fair carbon tax, then this is something that a shareholder-focused company will not consider. But still, that doesn't suggest going towards stakeholder capitalism, because there is another party who can deal with externalities, which is the government through taxation. And it's not just the government, but there's also ethical codes. Milton Friedman argued that companies should not only obey the law, but also follow ethical customers. So I think the key difference is when there's an externality and the externality is not dealt with by the government. And that could be for two reasons. One of them is the government failed to do something about it when it could, like a carbon tax. And the other is there's some things which are just very difficult to regulate. So how do you regulate a company having a great corporate culture, meaningful work, anti-discrimination and so on? Obviously, there's business reasons for wanting to implement that, but there could be societal reasons for that. And a stakeholder-focused company will try to minimize those externalities above and beyond the business case for doing so. But Alex, aren't we just asking businesses to do something that, you know, human beings aren't very good at, but just think about others? Don't people just think about themselves? Yeah, so this is why if you want to move to a stakeholder capitalism model, there has to be some constraints, there has to be accountability. Otherwise, anything goes, how do we know which stakeholders to address? You and I might have different views, right? If you're an energy company, you shut down a polluting plant, that's good for the environment, it's bad for workers, and it could be bad for the company, and it could be bad for the shareholders, which might include pension funds. So I think if you are going to have an objective other than long-term shareholder value, you need to have a clear shareholder mandate. And there could be ways of doing this. So one thing I've developed with a colleague, Tom Gosling, is the idea of a say on purpose, which would be an advisory vote that shareholders can have on non-financial objectives. You might know of, say, on climate, this has become quite popular, but purpose is more than just climate. There's many other stakeholders beyond the environment. And you don't need to formalise it like that, but there needs to be a way of getting shareholder buy-in, because otherwise, when a company is pursuing these other goals, it is spending shareholders' money. You can't just have a CEO pursuing his or her pet cause without this mandate from the ultimate owners of the business. We used to teach this case at Stanford on Google. If you look at Google's IPO and the stated documents in Google's IPO, the number one rule was do no evil. And they were very explicit. We don't care about profits. We care about doing no evil. So there was a case where the stakeholder model was explicit. And as we know, Google is nothing like that. Well, if indeed companies say something and then they do something else, that is bad for shareholders. But I would say that is no worse than in any other business decision. So if a company says we are going to be innovative and they're not doing that, 
or the company says we're going to expand geographically and they end up sort of taking the quiet life, that is also bad for shareholders. So what is strange is we have this issue of greenwashing, which is when companies say something that they don't deliver. And absolutely, that needs to be taken seriously. However, I would say it should be taken as seriously as any other business decision where companies say something and they don't deliver on that. Alex, just to push you a little on this, I would say we have to recognize the constraints in human behavior. They could say do no evil, but when they start doing business, they will follow their own what's good for them. And that inevitably will mean they will do quote unquote evil. I mean, when it comes down to putting me first and somebody else first, people put themselves first. Well, there's a couple of things that you can do to address that. So what really matters is incentives, as you say. So one thing that some companies are doing are trying to lengthen the horizon of CEO incentives, including lengthening it beyond the CEO's tenure. So they're required to hold shares even after their departure. So some of the externalities might not manifest within the CEO's tenure, but might manifest afterwards. But you still might think, well, even if you're holding your shares after the CEO's left, the externalities might still not manifest. And therefore, this is for other things such as government intervention to come in. So one of the issues with stakeholder capitalism, exactly as you say, is that companies may say things and not deliver on this. And this is why I do think the government needs to step in and take some action, because in the absence of that, just companies saying, oh, believe me, I'm going to care about wider society, you might not deliver on this. So we saw this with the business roundtable statement, 181 CEOs claim that they're going to serve wider society. But when the rubber hit the road, they didn't actually deliver on this. So we know this in in economics is cheap talk. If there's not a credible way to commit towards a particular source of action, then you may will just deviate and then do what maximizes your own profit. So Alex, in the context of that, I had a following question for you. I've heard you speak about this before, and I would love for you to elaborate a little bit on this. We have particular competitive advantages for particular institutions, and we also have particular purposes for particular institutions, right? And one thing that I think is behind the discussion you and Jonathan were just having is the question of, well, do corporations actually have a competitive advantage in fixing all of the issues that are generally brought up when we do speak about stakeholder capitalism? So I have two questions for you. One is... Do you think that corporations have a competitive advantage or can develop such a competitive advantage or how can shareholders make them develop such a competitive advantage, if at all? The second question that I'm very interested in is why now so much compared to, say, 10 years ago or 20 years ago? Because it seems to really have taken a flight. I think most of it remains the cheap talk, but everybody is pledging allegiance to these higher causes. And I'm just curious why we're seeing this now so much more than before. Two really good questions. So let me start with the first one. So do companies have a competitive advantage? Absolutely. So just as they have a competitive advantage in generating profits, they might be able to leverage that competitive advantage to address a social issue. So let me give an example. Vodafone is the UK telecoms giant. They had a technology which allowed people to send text messages to each other. They leveraged that and developed M-Pesa, which is a mobile money service where you can send money from person to person, just as you could easily send a text message. And so that means for Vodafone, out of all the societal issues that it could have been solving, climate change, biodiversity, and so on, it chose to solve financial inclusion. And I think that is really important because one interpretation of stakeholder capitalism is let's try to solve all of the world's problems. Let's try to tick every single of the 17 sustainable development goals. But I don't think companies should do that because of the constraints that Jonathan mentioned earlier. If you're going to be in a field in which you don't have expertise, you're going to be spending a lot of money. And actually, if you are going to make a verbal commitment to that, you probably are not going to deliver on it. Why? Because it's going to cost you so much. Whereas if you are developing a commitment like Vodafone to build a digital society that enhances socioeconomic progress, that is something with some credibility because you are using your expertise. You can create a lot of shareholder value without actually much cost. And what is really interesting is that it might profit them later. Why? Because if you're creating value for society, ultimately, people will pay you for that, and it was able to monetize m So for me, one of the more compelling reasons for stakeholder capitalism is if this inspires you to take some actions that you might not have done otherwise, 
And those actions may well end up leading to a profit if it's based on your competitive advantage. Like, I don't know why you and Jonathan set up this podcast to begin with. I'm sure it wasn't a profit calculation. And maybe somebody ends up listening to this podcast and thinks, oh, these are two really cool finance professors. Let me give them some data so they can write another paper or let me invite them to speak at a conference. But you never sort of made that calculation. Instead, if you're creating and disseminating knowledge using comparative advantage, later on you might benefit. So the second question you asked is why now? And I think there's two reasons and both reasons, I think there's a legitimate part and an illegitimate part. So the first reason is the business case. So people are realizing that many of these stakeholder issues do end up improving profits in the long term. I had a paper in the JFE in 2011 showing that employee satisfaction ultimately boosts long-term shelled returns. However, you do have many studies, often by consultancies, claiming that every single ESG issue pays off in long-term performance. And because of confirmation bias, people will lap that up uncritically because it's what they would like to believe. So I think many practitioners believe the business case is much stronger than it actually is, that ESG investing will always improve returns. So that's one reason. I think the second reason is the recognition that companies do have an impact on wider society. For example, in the pandemic, you had alcohol companies pivoting to make sanitizer and saving a huge amount of lives. And many of those shareholders, even though there was a cost to that, may have been willing to pay that cost to save life. But again, here, there needs to be some nuance is that you shouldn't then end up trying to solve all of the world's problems. And I think people think now companies should try to address all of those stakeholder issues. So we do see this mission creep where, yes, we realize that we can have a positive impact from society. But in many cases, this is through doing our core business in a great way. So Alex, well, John Cochran was on the show. He viewed stakeholder capitalism as a veiled attempt to increase government influence in the private sector. What's your view of that? My view is quite nuanced, as it has been for a number of these questions. So I actually don't think it's bad for stakeholder capitalists to try to influence the government. Why? Because the government does have a comparative advantage in addressing some issues with tools like taxation and regulation that nobody else has. So as an investor, I think it's much better for you to try to persuade the government to implement a carbon tax than for you to do things like divest from fossil fuel companies, which your paper has shown is not effective to begin with. However, I don't think stakeholder capitalism should be a way of supplanting the government by trying to sort of override issues that the government can decide for itself. So one topic I've done a lot of research on is, is CEO pay. And people say, well, we don't like CEOs being paid a lot because this leads to inequality. However, the government has a tool to address inequality, which is income tax. So you do have some investors and some other stakeholders saying we're going to vote against a high pay package for the CEO, irrespective of whether she's deserved it through creating long-term value, because we just don't like inequality. But I think unless we believe that the tax rate that the government has set has been lobbied or is not reflecting the electorate's preferences, I think that's an issue which should be left to the government. More recently in the UK, we had this quite prominent case where Sainsbury's, one of the supermarkets, there was a proposal for them to pay the living wage, which is significantly higher than the minimum wage. And actually that got opposition from some responsible investors because they said, well, this is really going to put the costs under out of control and jeopardize the sustainability of the business. Yes, we do want to treat work as well, but there is a minimum wage that the government has already set. And there's no clear reason why the government has set this wrongly. So we should not supplant the government by trying to change what is something which has been justifiably set by the government. Well, Alex, thank you so much. I mean, this is excellent. That was really great, Alex. Thank you so much. Thanks. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcasts. We love to hear from our listeners. And be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcasts. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal podcast is a production of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and is produced by Alumni FM.